Hi there everyone, today we've got a video about flat earthers, anti-vaxxers, trolling, death threats. You probably think this is going to be a really modern video, but no, Keith Moore here at the Royal Society, you're taking us back to the 1800s. I am. I, I think we should just kind of raise, raise our eyes a little bit first before we get into that uh, with a bit of poetry. I, I like a bit of culture. Yeah. yeah I promised yeah. people sort of all this modern stuff and you're... Oh, oh, we'll, we'll, you have to lower the tone, but we'll, we'll get to that. We have here the first edition of Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica. That's a first edition. First edition. That's probably not a cheap thing you're holding right now. Though. No, that's not a cheap thing I'm holding. That, that's worth quite a lot of money these days. Yeah. Beautifully bound, as you can see. There's lots of science stuff in there, as you can see. But I'm not interested in that. We are a poem, don't we? And there is a poem in here. There's so a poem in the Principia. There is a poem in the Principia. OK, so in the sort of the preface to the Principia, we have a poem dedicated to Newton, written by his friend, Edmund Halley, of Halley's Comet fame, of course. That's right, yeah. And he's getting in on the ground floor because Newton, of course, a genius, and uh, many subsequent poets uh, lauded his achievements. William Wordsworth looks at the statue of, of Newton in, in Trinity and comes up with a fantastic couplet, the marble index of a mind forever voyaging through strange seas of thought alone. Fabulous stuff. Beautiful. So Isaac Newton is now this inspiring poetry. He is, but we're not going to do that kind of poetry. We're going to do this kind of poetry. All right. This one is by John Hampden. He's uh, a Victorian flat earther. He also doesn't like Newton very much, amongst his other claims to fame. And uh, this is a poem that he writes about Sir Isaac Newton. It says here, the fall of the apple or the tipsy philosopher. What Hamden is saying is that only a complete drunk would have come up with the idea of gravity as so insane. He claims that when Newton was sitting in the orchard with the fall of the apple, uh, he'd had a few. Yeah, well, I mean, he makes it clear right from the start. It says here, old Isaac sat under his apple tree, quaffing his good old wine. He eyed his decanter right merrily and lauded the fruit of the vine. <laughs> oh, bring me another full bottle, he cried, and carry the empties away. For wine aids reflection when fitly applied, and I would be pensive today. He drank and he studied, he studied and drank, until he could study no more. Then into a slumber he quietly sank, and varied his thoughts with a snore. It's actually quite good. Well, yeah, in it's a rhyme. sort of sense of humour, yeah. yeah. He, uh, Newton gets the, the spins at one point in, in the poem here, which I'm, I'm sure you know nothing about that, Brady, but... Um, no. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and the, the end section is, is worth a read. He, he gives a little prose conclusion there. Okay, so after the poem's finished, it's quite, I mean, it's two pages, there's mm. quite a bit to it. There is a little kind of explanation here. It says, It is believed that Sir Isaac Newton got his idea of gravitation, in quotation marks, from seeing an apple fall from a tree. Surely any man must have been in liquor or insane who invented such preposterous theories as rotundity and revolution, gravitation and attraction from the fall of an apple, and there and then applied such conflicting principles to the universe which the Almighty had created without having recourse to any such monstrous absurdities. Yeah, so... Uh, and, then he, and then he says at the oh, end yeah. here that we've got John Hampton, 14, Hatherley Grove, Bayswater. So if you send your, your sixpence to Hampton, he'll send you some more, some more flyers like this. OK, I, I'm staying in Bayswater tonight, so I just oh, yeah, I want to, caught my the, eye. There we go, yeah. there we go. <laughs> so um, Hampton is a fundamentalist. He's a flat earther, amongst other things, mm. and uh, really quite a nasty piece of work. All right. Where does this take us next, Keith? Hamden's famous for, for one other thing, uh, and that's a, a conflict with another famous scientist, uh, not Isaac Newton, but one of his contemporaries, Alfred Russell Wallace. Alfred Russell Wallace. Now, that is a familiar name. So Wallace is with Charles Darwin. Uh, the two of them come up with the idea of evolution right. uh, by natural selection. So Wallace is a big, big figure in 19th century science. Wallace had a, a range of interests over his lifetime. We can see here the first edition of one of his books, Island Life, where he looks at uh, the distribution of animals across lines from Asia to Australia. And the Wallace line, the mark between the two, is, is named after him. So he's a full-on important naturalist, amongst other things. Big deal. 
deal, big deal guy. Mm. How does he get become entangled with our friend Hampton? Uh, it's over a bet. A bet. A bet. So Hampton um, placed a bet of five hundred pounds that no scientist could prove that the Earth was round. Okay. Uh, he put it in a journal called uh, Scientific Opinion, and uh, the challenge was out there. Who took it up? Alfred Russell Wallace. And um, it didn't work out quite the way he expected. But he did prove that the Earth was round. He did. Yeah. Uh, he did, yep. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're, we're on safe ground there. Okay, good. Um, so uh, in 1870, there was a famous experiment. He, he set up an experiment to demonstrate this, to prove to Hamden that the Earth was round. It's called the Bedford Level Experiment. And we can see it in his, his okay. reminiscences here. This is Alfred Russell Wallace's My Life, a record of events and opinions. So he, he describes what happens uh, in the section here. You see references to the uh, old Bedford Canal in Norfolk has a stretch of six miles quite straight between two bridges. So if the Earth is round, this is what you would expect to see. So your telescope is here, there's a marker on the other bridge, there's a point in the middle, and uh, that point is going to be higher than the mark on the bridge if there's curvature on the Earth. Yep. If the Earth is absolutely flat, you should get a straight line, everything should line up, and you shouldn't be able to see that second marker. And you've got the water of the canal as your sort of your baseline. Exactly okay, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. So this is a height above uh, the water level. Yeah. And you can see the little bridge marker here. And he uses a telescope, looks at the bridge in the distance and the marker in the foreground. That's right. And he sees the markers raised. Lo and behold, yep, the marker is above the bar level here. Yep. So uh, therefore, he knows the Earth is curved. He wins the bet and, and Hampton goes home, apologises, says, you were right, I was wrong, the earth is round, thanks for coming. No, no, that's no, not, no, 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 that's not what happens. <laughs> that's not what happens with these guys, no, no. Right. Uh, uh, Hampton, well, he repeated the experiment several times, so there, there were glitches that they, they sorted out, and uh, Wallace describes them here. But in the end, I should say that uh, both Wallace uh, and uh, Hampton had referees with them as well, just to, to make sure that the, uh, uh, the thing was done properly. Hmm. Um, uh, Hampton refused to look through the telescope. Wouldn't so, even look. No, 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 he didn't look. He trusted his referee, and his referee simply said, Oh, the earth's flat, that's it. Okay, right. Yep. <laughs> All right. Yep. All right. And you can see the view through the telescope. Here's sketches made by the, the referees. Okay. Go and read about this, people. It's a really interesting experiment. The journal who originally published the bet found in favour of, of Wallace, of course. Then Hampton really gets on the case. He, he begins to libel. Alfred Russell Wallace. So yeah. he uh, does this verbally, he sends letters to Wallace and his family. It becomes very, very messy indeed. And we can see some of the letters which Wallace reproduces here. There's basically a chapter of this autobiography dedicated to all these problems he had with Hampton. Mm. This one here particularly catches the eye. This is a letter that Hampton wrote to Mrs. Wallace, yeah. to Wallace's wife. It's pure vitriol. Yeah. yeah, it really is. Madam, if your infernal thief of a husband is brought home someday on a hurdle with every bone in his head smashed to pulp, you will know the reason. Do you tell him from me he is a lying infernal thief and as sure as his name is Wallace, he never dies in his bed. You must be a miserable wretch to be obliged to live with a convicted felon. Do not think or let him think I have done with him. John Hampton. It's pretty disgusting stuff, really. Yeah. You know? And he uh, does, Wallace does take this to the police and goes yeah. to a magistrate. Mm. Uh, it says here, for this I brought him up before a police magistrate and he was bound over to keep the peace for three months, suffering a week's imprisonment mm. before he could find the necessary sureties. We have here 1871, 1872, 1873. Court cases, liable, public apologies are printed in papers from Hampton, but yep. then he just starts again with the libels. Yep. It goes on for years and years and years. Two months imprisonment in Newgate. Bankruptcy uh, attempts, uh, and it, it just goes on. And here's sort of the last thing that Wallace has to say about it all. Do you want to read that for us, Keith? Sure. It says the two lawsuits, the four prosecutions for libel, the payments and costs of the settlement amounted to considerably more than the £500 I received from Hampton. 
besides which I bore all the costs of the week's experiments and between 15 and 20 years of continued persecution, a tolerably severe punishment for what I did not at the time recognise as an ethical lapse. They say you shouldn't engage with trolls. Don't read the comments. Don't reply. Just yeah. don't, don't reply. No. I think Wallace learned that lesson. Yeah, and trolls always hang around bridges, don't they, really? They do. <laughs> they do. They do. Uh, anyway, we tend to think of this as a, as a modern phenomenon. Crazy ideas on the internet, trolling and so on. But no, he, here it is. People were doing it uh, in the 19th century as well. It's a very old thing. It seems almost a bit more visceral too, doesn't it? Because you've got the bits of paper in your hand and you're seeing the people. And... Yeah, but really, really quite nasty. The, the poem is fun and it's nice to have it in the collections. But, it, but it's a record of that kind of anti-scientific thinking that is, is pernicious and um, really quite nasty. Keith's got a little postscript for you from the very same book, from Wallace's book. Well, Wallace was very good at uh, debunking certain things. So uh, Hampton is a good example of that. But of course, Wallace himself uh, got into some areas that we would now consider to be quite weird. So yes, uh, here we have his spiritual experiences. So We've... he, I think, was initially an agnostic, but the spiritual as a movement caught his attention and he, he joined in on that. A whole chapter called Spiritualistic Experiences. Yep. And the very next chapter? The anti-vaccination crusade. Wallace began to apply statistical methods to whether or not vaccination was effective. And he came, came to the conclusion that it, it was uh, exaggerated, the effect of vaccination. Of course, we know we know very well that vaccination works well. We've got over 300 years of science to, to demonstrate. Well, he thought the same. He says here, mm. I was brought up to believe that vaccination was a scientific procedure and that Jenner was one of the great benefactors of mankind. I was vaccinated in infancy, he says, mm. and before going to the Amazon, I was persuaded to be vaccinated again. My children were duly vaccinated. And on he goes. But then he picks up some literature. Mm. Mm, he he yeah. reads something. I first heard there were anti-vaccinators and read some articles on the subject. These did not much impress me as I could not believe so many eminent men could be mistaken on such an important matter. But a little later, I met Mr. William Tebb and through him was introduced to some of the more important statistical facts bearing upon the subject. Slippery slope. And there yeah, it begins. Slippery slope. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah. And then we have a whole chapter on his anti-vaccination crusade. Even the best of scientists, even the ones who come up with great ideas, uh, can, can get it wrong on some things. And I guess it's a factor of, of having a sceptical frame of mind. You know, it's good to challenge accepted facts, certainly, um, but it's bad to ignore evidence like the Bedford Level experiment when it's right in front of your nose. All right. I'm going to finish reading this poem. I quite like it. Oh, we've converted you to poetry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, he, when Keith said he had poetry for me, I was, eh. but this is a, uh, this is not bad. <laughs> Don't think much of this Hampton guy, though. He seems no. like he seems like a rotten apple. No, no. But we'll, we'll get you reading some poetry. Okay. Okay, Keith. What treasures have you uh, dug up for us here? These are all made of wood. The wood. The, the apple tree wood. Yes. So let's get this straight. These three objects are all made of wood from the apple tree at Woolsthorpe Manor, Correct. where Isaac Newton grew up. That was maybe the apple tree he saw the apple fall from that made him think about gravity. Exactly right.